to take up any of our uh, speakers' time this morning. I just want to introduce Mr. Kevin Hunstra, Chief Technology Officer at Matilda Cyber, uh, Cyber Tech. And uh, please welcome you to join me, Mr. Hunstra. Good morning. Well, thank you for joining. I, I know it's an early time slot. It's a rainy day, and I'm sure a lot of you uh, were out at some of the vendor social events last night. So I appreciate you coming in early to hear a little bit about the persistent training environment that we've built. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. As mentioned, uh, I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Matova CyberSense. A little bit about my background. Um, I uh, did Air Force uh, Cyber Protection Team operations for about uh, 12 years before moving into this role. Um, so I've got a background in training cyber operators, primarily on the defensive side. Uh, and I've also served as the communication sector chief uh, for the Denver InfraGuard. If you're not familiar with InfraGuard, it's a public-private partnership between uh, industry and, and the FBI. And I do a lot of training events, um, both at the local and national event. Uh, association um, with that. A little bit about uh, Matova CyberSense. Um, so we were the first DOD cyber range. Technology was built originally back in 2001 in partnership uh, with the US Air Force, became a commercial product in uh, 2007, and we have been evolving the platform since. Um, so Matova Federal, um, our organization, we're a service-disabled veteran-owned small business. Um, you may ma know Matova best here in the Augusta area as the prime contractor on the Army Cyber Battle Lab. Um, so we do both a services element and a products element. And some of you may have been attending the uh, CyberQuest sessions. Uh, we were the cyber platform that was used for CyberQuest, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later today. Um, but as far as the focus of the discussions today, we'll talk a little bit about what we do in the cyber training or exercising space, and then we'll focus on a couple case studies as for platforms that we've built uh, for training the cyber mission forces. Um, note that we also do use the platform for non-DOD entities, that's uh, federal government, state and local government, and now we're also branching into academia as well. Uh, a quick view as far as our geographical presence, as far as the distribution of our cyber trainers. Um, you can see here we're pretty widely distributed. We have some centralized platforms, uh, like within the Navy. Um, we've got a platform uh, out at uh, Norfolk uh, that's uh, centralized, remotely accessed. And then within the Air Force, we primarily do geographically distributed platforms. Many of these that you see here are Air National Guard sites that they're using for their CPT trainers. Uh, and then of course here, uh, we have a, a platform in the Cyber Battle Lab along with providing services for them. Uh, so what is a cyber range? Well, it can mean a lot of different things for a lot of different people, but as far as what we view as the ecosystem within the cyber range, you first have the infrastructure components, so that would be all of the routing and switching platforms, all of the network transport, it then has a hypervisor. In our case, it's Linux KVM um, that you run the systems on. That allows you to uh, snapshot the machines and restore those. And then the software overlay that provides all of the services. You're also going to have some of the, the core services that make the network run, so the, the electric and the plumbing that, that keeps things moving. Uh, we have a traffic generation component. Uh, we have a threat emulation component so that we can mimic uh, the techniques of the adversary. And then we have a range management. That's the single pane of glass that allows you to monitor uh, the environment along with build the scenarios that you execute while you're doing your training uh, or your exercises. And then, of course, things that track what's going on on the range, provide scoring, uh, those types of elements. Uh, so here's what we have as the architecture that we've built for the persistent cyber training environment. Um, up here at the top, we have the WAN connectivity. This could be um, uh, anything from public internet. It could be the Doden. It could be a joint IL range node. Uh, anything that allows connectivity into the environment. Now internal, here's the pieces that we build as a part of a, our solution. Um, starting here with the remote access solution, uh, we have a, a method to either terminate an HTML5 uh, session uh, Windows Remote Desktop, 
or a remote access VPN to allow connectivity into the environment. Over here to the side, we have the learning management system that provides your single sign-in access to all of the content or curriculum uh, that you have mapped to your cyber learning environment and allows you to tr track the progress of all of your operators as they go through uh, the mission objectives and mission qualification on whatever system they're using for their defensive or offensive cyber operations. Once they go through the content that's associated with the curriculum or the exercise, they are then forwarded into the cyber training environment. And this piece is that emulated risk-free environment that they use for mission rehearsal, for experimentation, for TTP development. In our case, we've got a, uh, a product called the Range Global Internet. This is a, a high fidelity emulation of the internet space. Uh, it's a, a build out of uh, 74 tier one routers, all the BGP connections between those, um, the root DNS servers, the root NTP servers, all of the services that would be provided by your internet service provider are in this box so that you can have an offline copy of that, um, along with copies of uh, 100 cached uh, versions of websites. Uh, there's a social media component, so we have a, a Facebook and Twitter-like capability. That's all within our emulated internet space. Over here to the side, we have a uh, virtualized cyber classroom. This is where you would do your individualized type training. So when you have individual learning elements that require a small scale network, um, those environments are provisioned in this space uh, so that a, an instructor can lead you through the content. And then we have a team trainer. What this does is create an emulation of a full base area network that allows you to interoperate between all the different crew positions or positions that you may have on the squads of your different cyber protection teams so that the actions of one impact the environment of all. Whereas in the virtual classroom, uh, the objectives that you're, um, the actions that you take aren't modifying the environment for the other students. Any questions on the persistent cyber training environment architecture? Okay, so here's a quick look at uh, uh, one of the PCTEs that we built for the U.S. Air Force. Uh, so in this case, uh, it is, uh, it's called the Air National Guard Virtual Interconnected Training Environment. Uh, we, employed, we deployed 13 of these ranges in 2016, and in 2017, we're deploying an additional 13 of them. They were the ones that are geographically distributed, but can then all be interconnected or federated to do joint exercises. So what you're looking at here is the training system that's used for the Cyber Vulnerability Assessment Hunter, the CVAH, which is the defensive cyber weapon system employed uh, by the Air Force CPTs. Um, so what we built here, uh, we have the Range Global Internet, which is the emulation of the internet environment. And then out in that gray space, we've got um, all of the internet routing, we've got attackers, uh, we've got network services, um, we've got traffic bots. And then those uh, come into what here is the, the base area environment. So we've got all of the technologies that are used at the Air Force network defense perimeter. Um, so we've got a, a McAfee security platform, uh, we've got a series of the different firewalls that are used within the uh, Air Force or the Air National Guard environment. And then internal to the network, we've got a build out of an emulation of uh, the core services of a base area network. Active Directory, Exchange, HBSS, ACAS, all the tools that they would use for defensive cyber operations. Uh, we've also got all the elements that would be associated with the, the DMZ component. So we've got the external mail gateway, uh, we've got an external DNS server, web services, and, and a, a blue coat. And then on top of this, we overlay all of our traffic generation and our threat emulation. Uh, one of the unique things about how we do traffic is, is rather than taking an interesting payload, putting a false source and destination header on it, and injecting it into the wire, we actually stand up a virtual machine. We have a simulated user log into that virtual machine using credentials uh, populated within uh, the account databases, that simulated users executes the action, whether it be browsing the web, um, checking their email, um, sending a message, and then that traffic goes across uh, the network and we stand up a destination node that it's received. 
So rather than just having um, like a, a PCAP of the network data that you want to see, we have a source, a destination, an RFC, true uh, TCP IP compliant connection so that you can do all the forensics on the endpoints, which is um, uh, the level of fidelity that you need for a cyber protection team uh, for when they're doing the hunt mission. Any questions on what we built? Yes. Absolutely. So um, typically when we build out a uh, cyber training environment, it's owned and operated by the customer. So we come into an initial requirements meeting. They define what architecture they want, what technologies they want, the scope and scale of what's necessary for the fidelity of their training environment. And then we go out and we procure all of the equipment from each of the individual vendors. We have the, that equipment shipped to our facility. We build out the architecture internal uh, in our lab. We overlay traffic generation threat emulation on top of it. And then we bring the customer, and in this case, the air guard, to validate that we've gotten the configuration right. Once they validate that it looks the way they want, we pack everything up. We ship it out to each of the facilities that are going to be receiving the platform. We integrate it into their existing environment along with providing any of the remote access connectivity that they need for it. Uh, and then we train them on the, the platform, how to both maintain it and then how to use the features within it. And then it's handed over to them, uh, generally owned and operated by that customer. In the case of the Air Guard, they have blue suitors that run the environment, provide all the training, the instruction. In the case of the Navy, um, we actually provide the training content along with um, some of the scheduling, the exercise planning required for it. So you can either buy it as a, uh, just a platform or you can get product attached services to help you run it. Any other questions? So uh, the CVAH trainer, this is about one rack of equipment. Now it depends on how much you want to have on the hypervisor versus in actual hardware. Uh, so in their case, they wanted to have physical routers and switches um, because they're gonna be plugging in. Um, they have uh, mobile information platforms. Um, they've got, in some cases, ICS systems, SCADA systems, and I have a couple pictures of those. But if you want hardware in the loop, you need physical ports. If you don't need physical ports, we can virtualize all of these appliances. We can do all of these um, in uh, open V switches on the hypervisor, and you can do everything in a single 2U server. Um, and we, we've run in that configuration as well. So it, it really depends on how much hardware you need. Other questions? If we have time, I can show you one of the rack diagrams. Here's uh, the Navy Cyber Operations Training Simulator. It's called NCOTS. Uh, it models Echelon 2 and 3 of the Navy environment. Uh, this one is located at the Navy NIOC in Norfolk, Virginia. Again, we've got an emulation of the internet space out here. And then what they chose to do is an emulation of five ships along with the NOC and the NC dock. So this is the, the security services. This is the network operations, and then here's the ships. The ships can either be in a, um, a, like a docked configuration where they're all underneath the services of the NOC, or we can do an at-sea at configuration where we remove them and they operate independently, um, so they provide all of their own security services um, while they're away. Um, so we can run it in both of those different uh, ways. Now, you'll see there's a, both a red and a green component. So we have an emulation of both uh, NipperNet and CipperNet services. Uh, we've got uh, bulk encryptors that we use to tunnel the NipperNet over CipperNet, which is what they do uh, on the Navy side. And this system is, uh, I think it's, it's about three racks of equipment to build out. And I only have three ships shown here, but they do have five. Um, and it is hosted off of CipperNet, but remotely ac accessible from any CipperNet, Navy CipperNet terminal in the world. So um, the Air Guard chose to have their ranges deployed at the flight or squadron level, whereas the Navy decided to centralize and have everyone remotely access it um, over CipperNet. 
similar to the, the Air Force within each of their configurations. Um, they've got uh, a, a boundary, they've got an internal network, and then they have the um, CPT specific tools internal for network defense. They've got HBSS, they've got ACAS. In the case of Navy, they have Security Onion that they use to do their training. They use this for both CPT uh, training along with um, just general IT training um, as well. Any questions on the Navy configuration? Okay, CyberQuest. So I'm not sure how many of you guys have had a chance to come out and um, hear some of the sessions that they've had in the engagement theater, but um, of course, Matova, we are the prime contractor at the Battle Lab, so we ran, uh, ran a lot of the CyberQuest elements, but we were also the cyber platform on which the cyber elements, um, uh, the injects were done. Um, so of course, this was an exercise done uh, last month uh, in cooperation with the 10th Mountain Division. Uh, it was a combination of cyber, EW, along with uh, physical. So it was, uh, the focus was SEMA operations in, for multi-domain battle. Um, and so we were the cyber element on which we emulated uh, both the high and the low side uh, tactical network connectivity. And then we were the ones that did the traffic injection um, along with the uh, attacks into the environment. So we were the gray space along with cyber injects. Um, you can see we did um, both electro not our platform, but uh, other participants did uh, EW injects. We did all of the cyberspace injects. Those were done concurrently along with a MNS model that was done in one SAF. Uh, so the, the commander uh, at the talk, he was getting things um, to him through one SAF, through the cyber domain and EW all at the same time. So uh, a lot of it was seeing how the tools would interoperate and how they would react in those different situations. I can give you a quick, um, here's a quick view of one of the injects that we had uh, within the example. So this is the overlay that they used for the scenario uh, within the event. Um, Ellis was us, the friendly force. Attica was the attacking force. And then you had elements that were associated uh, as friendly to Attica. So we were located here at Gordon. Um, an example of some of the traffic generation, uh, we would have users periodically browsing to IP space that was associated with friendly elements, um, so that would be normal traffic. Uh, we would also have users that would be browsing to uh, what would be considered unfriendly sites, so we could do intel injects where we would say this is a potential insider threat. In this case, we have a, a non-friendly actor did a spear phishing email into one of the users on the domain uh, during the exercise. Uh, they browsed to that link. That link was actually associated with a real world inject or exploit associated with a vulnerability in the Mozilla browser. Uh, when they browsed to that link, we were able to get a back door uh, installed to the system. Once that back door was installed, uh, we swapped over to another attacker that was on a different IP space that was then able to get command and control into the network uh, in order to uh, cause cyber effects. Um, so in this case, we were able to get uh, a backdoor channel to allow us to turn on the webcam and the microphone. So we had an unclassed computer within the talk that could then listen in on all of the battle preparation for the next day. Um, so we had audio and video associated with that. We also did some pretty cool hardware injects where we soldered a, a two-port USB hub into a, a keyboard, and then we used a USB rubber ducky to turn on a wireless NIC and remotely connect a, a tactical high-side computer into um, Nippernet. So we had remote access onto the, the mission side as well. I'm just about out of time here. Um, a couple of things that we're working on. Uh, we're, we're doing a small business innovation research um, project. We just moved into phase two with the U.S. Army. Um, that uh, is focused on creating cyberspace effect um, with the modeling and simulation environment. So what you see here, this is a, a one SAF simulation. And what we've done is we've created a software broker that allows you to take cyber injects that are in a uh, cyber for cyber environment and move those over into one SAF. 
and also the inverse, a uh, two-way exchange where something that happens in one SAF, let's say a kinetic effect um, where you take out a, uh, a battlefield location, had a cyber element, that can then be taken out of the cyber model. So it allows you to link those two elements together for multi-domain battle. Um, we are the uh, cyber platform. Um, if you're familiar with uh, ITSEC that's held down in Orlando in November, um, we provide the cyber effects. Uh, we do things like denial of service. We degrade the video streams for the Predator drones or the, um, the airframes. Uh, we can modify uh, GPS or tracks associated with the environment. Um, so here's one of our engineers. Uh, so if you do make it out to ITSEC, you can see us there. Um, we're the platform that they use for, for cyber. I think this is my last slide here. Um, we also, um, one thing that makes us unique um, compared to a lot of the other vendors that are cloud hosted um, is that we do allow hardware in the loop. Um, you own the actual uh, simulator so you don't have to just request services from us. We build it to your spec and ship it to your environment. That allows you to connect in things like Air Force weapon systems. We've connected uh, ICS platforms. This is uh, one of the Air National Guard modules that has a, an HMI and a PLC that emulates a, a nuclear power factory. Um, we've built out uh, inside this truck is a mobile version of our uh, cyber range platform that can be driven to a customer site. They drag fiber in and they can run exercises from within that truck. Um, we do the training for uh, DHS and FEMA through a partnership with Texas A&M where um, uh, defense of critical national infrastructure. And we've just recently started adding in um, IoT and SDN because we know those are elements that the DOD is, is highly interested in. If you do have any questions, uh, that's my email address here. Uh, we do have a, a booth uh, downstairs. We're in uh, number 217. You can come by. I've got remote access into a persistent cyber training environment. Um, so you can actually put your hands on one of them if you're interested. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, in lieu of a speaker gift, SC will be making a donation to Fisher House uh, in, on your behalf. So thank you again. For yeah, thank you very much. Uh, a quick admin note before we have a really brief break. Uh, for anybody planning to attend the 11 o'clock session, integrate FEMA. but we will have our 1130 session on cybersecurity ranges and integrated team services facilities. So uh, thanks again. We're going to do a quick changeover, and we'll get started again at 830. Testing, 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 testing.
thank you again for being here this morning. Um, we're just going to go ahead and get started with our second position review. Our speakers this morning are from Cisco, uh, Systems Engineer uh, Anthony Swanson and Technical Solutions Architect Dave Lee. Today we're going to be talking about software-defined access. Um, as we go along, feel free to ask questions about uh, anything you see up on the slides. We do have some swag here for people that do ask questions, so first come, first serve. Uh, not to uh, prod you guys to be participating, but please feel free to do so. Um, before we get into the software-defined access solution, we're going to talk a little bit about the technology drivers uh, today on the enterprise network. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the Internet of Things. In the document um, Shaping the Army Network 2025 to 2040, the Army talks about the Internet of Things and harnessing them as sensors on the network. You know, as sensors, we have to collect information locally, regionally, and globally and hand that information off to a diverse set of users so that the warfighter gets all the information they need for the mission. So some of the challenges that the network faces with that is how do I authorize a thing to a network? How do I ensure that they securely authenticate to the network? How do I scale up and scale down bandwidth in a manner that allows me to get the information back to the analytics engine or the user that's going to be processing that information? And then how do I segment those devices in a way to ensure that they're only talking to the things that they're supposed to or the users that they're supposed to? And then we have cloud. And there's a lot of initiatives around cloud right now. We have the Accent contract, which is driving cloud adoption within the Army. We have Army Private Cloud Enterprise, which is trying to bring on-prem services, cloud on-prem services to the Army. And then we have vendors like Microsoft and Amazon that are providing cloud services to federal. And so this is paving a way for a multi-cloud, hybrid cloud scenario where you bring your own application. And the challenge to the network with bringing your own application is, how do I ensure that my policy is the same for on-prem applications and off-prem applications? How do I instantiate policy in an environment that I don't control? And then finally, we have cybersecurity. And the network is playing a more important part with cybersecurity than it ever has before. We have you know, different attack vectors happening now where before we were worried about attackers coming from the outside in, and now they're coming from the inside and making their way out. We have advanced malware that's encrypting traffic and ex, you know, exfilling it outside of the network. And then we have different um, attack surfaces where before we were worried about single device attacks and now they're attacking across multiple devices. And so the challenge to the network with that is how do I leverage the network as a sensor and provide analytics back so that I can act in a faster manner and quarantine those attacks in a much more efficient way. The traditional network today, though, cannot keep up with these needs. Configuration of the network is very complex. When we have to change the network for mission needs or mission tempo, I have to go out and configure multiple devices. I have to configure VLANs, VRFs, subnets, and ACLs. And on top of that, I have to go out and create routing policy and switching policy for the protocols. And this all delays the mission significantly. In addition to that, it's difficult to segment the network and the size that it currently is. We have you know, more users and devices coming onto the network than we ever have before. And we have you know, more VLANs and VRFs that we have to worry about and instantiating routing policy for all of that. In addition to that, Federal has a unique requirement where we have bulk encryption units. And it's difficult to extend layer two segmentation to different devices across these bulk encryptors. I read an article the other day that said the Doden experiences 22,000 network changes on a day. They have 10 million alerts generated. Do we think that network engineers today can actually process through 10 million alerts? Is it possible that we can have consistent policy when we have multiple network engineers configuring 22,000 changes? The way that I interpret policy may be different than the way Dave interprets policy. And the users will get a very different outcome based off of who is interpreting that policy or the IA, you know, sort of initiatives. And then in addition to that, we have very different domains for wired and wireless. 
Today my identity is tied to an IP address as well as my location. And so when I sit on a wired network, I have a very different identity than when I roam to a wireless network. My policies are completely different. The access lists, the firewall rules, those are all different because they're based off of different IP addresses and therefore different identities. So it makes it very difficult to troubleshoot when a user has an issue. Does it correlate to the wired network? Does it correlate to the wireless network? At what point do I experience issues and how do I trace that down to the network that's actually experiencing the problem? So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about what Cisco is doing to try and address these challenges. We have a product shipping now called Software Defined Access. It's part of our DNA um, Software Defined Suite. And at the very bottom, we have an infrastructure level of DNA ready devices. Those are our SDN capable devices. They're, it consists of routers, switches, wireless LAN controllers, and access points. And sitting one tier above that, we have our on-prem services that provide services to those infrastructure components. We have Identity Services Engine, which provides authentication and segmentation to the fabric. We have APIC-EM, which is our enterprise class uh, SDN controller. And then we have something called Network Data Platform. And the Network Data Platform uh, provides analytics across the fabric. Sitting above that, we have something called DNA Center, which is an application that runs on our APIC controller. And that DNA center provides a single pane of glass to provision workflows for design, provision, policy, and assurance functions. And its goal is to simplify the configuration tasks of the, of the normal network. So when we take a look at software-defined access, we break down the benefits into three pillars. The first pillar is segmentation. With segmentation, we are level, leveraging an API to the uh, ICE appliance, and what that actually is doing, it's allowing us to provide two-tier segmentation. So we can apply segmentation at a macro level and a micro level. So when I talk about macro level, I'm talking about between two different groups, maybe a group of users and a group of devices or two groups of users. I can instantiate policy between those two and say group A can talk to group B or group A doesn't talk to group B. And then at a micro level, I'm talking about instantiating policy within a single group. So if Dave and I belong to the same group and we decide that we don't communicate with each other, we can actually instantiate a policy that says, even though that we're in the same group, Dave and I never communicate with each other. The next is simple automated workflows. The goal behind DNA Center is to provide a, a intent-based provisioning system. And so what we want to be able to do is provide very simple workflows around, around the design, policy, provision, and assurance that renders intent across the fabric as opposed to going and hand configuring everything on a per device basis. So when the network engineer goes in, they go and they express their intent for the policy, and then that controller renders that intent and pushes it across the entire fabric at one time. And then finally, we have Intelligent Network. That centers around our network data platform, and what the goal of that is, is to ingest uh, logs and, and output from network services, as well as the fabric, and provide analytics back to the network engineer. What we're trying to do is automate a lot of the manual tasks of today, and so through that, that network data platform, we can actually see fabric health, we can see user issues. When Dave calls me and tells me he's having connectivity issues, the controller can actually look at that, see what the issue is, and then offer some sort of resolution. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Dave and he's gonna talk a little bit more about what each part does. It's, it's VXLAN based, VXLAN with a list control plane.
Lord and say, Lord, we're going to open up our Bible to you. We've got some new scriptures that are really important. Give them a shot. All right, thanks, Anthony. So Anthony's kind of given an overview of the group, and we're going to provide a few more details and then come back later with that answer. But let me just say, when he talked about the Ephesus Faith Mission, DNA stands for Jesus Loves Me. And at the top of the application, it says, what does Jesus love me? And the last part of it says, what does faith have to provide us with? So all of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today is really in the context of DNA stands. And all of it deals with really important things. But it's just been just to talk about the fact that in seeing this flyer in the Bible, it talks about the three different faith movements. Before SCI, I've said many times that Wild Faith and Wild Church are not the same thing. The Wild Church is not my view of what the term Wild Youth is. The point is that it's supposed to be a different outreach platform for how Jesus views us as a church and what we should do. You also have the Thessalonians because it was a flyer with device that said, moving from one part of the network to another will cross the border to boundaries in the middle of the Roman Empire. Two address to our community. And then additionally, uh, the two address to our community. So the identity of the device is also the identity of the faith movement that I believe in. And it's also uh, the faith movement that I will compare and I ask you to compare to determine what that overall group looks like. So if you have a two address form, you potentially have a lot of different what SCI does, what we are here for, is we really consolidate the wild church and the wild youth into a single piece of identity-based practice, identity-based control With that, we'll have the ability to seamlessly blend and work within the wilder to apply from the fabric today. Across the fabric, regardless of where you land, the kind of two addresses you have maintain the maintain the risk of loss. So that is the identity of Grenada and Cross and the Cape and Aurora and Rome and Pensacola and Memphis and all of those across the fabric. And then lastly, we'll have single mass and we'll apply it to the NOAC Southern Cross. And then it's really, as Anthony talked a lot about it too, uh, it's about adopting Christ to your core. When you have these large numbers of devices and everyone is trying to connect, in many cases you want to be able to segment these devices from their users. You don't want to just have a thousand or more devices that are attempting to connect to each other. But today and that can be very complex and distracting to have that ability to potentially be all in for all faith and all that and come out of the wild and come out of the wild church. It's a pretty complex Then you have the number of IP addresses that that will have on them is just increasing dramatically. So each time one of these devices has an issue, you've got to track down the IP address, figure out first of all what IP address it could be before you can use the compute, or it's located in another country. It's just all about that segmentation of what's going on. And then part of the segmentation, sometimes the segmentation of problems is really about the encryption. So a lot of times I'll send email to my friends and say, hey, I want to encrypt this so that you can't get to it. So that's the abstract. But the idea is to really have these intuitive, identity-based, segmentation of two device profiles. So that the device comes onto the network. If the user device, you have to have a typical authentication or a customer account, and then the other two devices are going to have their own unique identity. Uh, if it's an IoT device, it's automatically going to be doing all of the work for you. You may not know what that device is doing. You may not be thinking about what that encryption code is. So you have the ability to kind of profile, upgrade it, put it into your virtual network, and then to group it in there and then have two kind of separate identities that you can use. With the group assignment, it also gives you more level of visibility. What is the device and what should it be able to do? You shouldn't have IoT devices totally taking over the wild church. You can sometimes use them to do more than just kind of work with what's on the network. And then lastly, with these systems that provide what Anthony said, the purpose of today, um, we have
have you know, embedded into it these digital dimensions that are that are kind of almost like the the the, the bedrock of what we're doing here. Yeah. Okay. And so the theme here really is about access, software design and access. So again, we're talking about how are we getting users to use these things, more devices, more users, and getting them on as quickly as possible. We learn from the past that that's usually the problem. We use these things. Many times that policy just kind of sits out across multiple enforcement stands in the network. So if there's uh, a policy about how you can't attend this particular issue in the lab, a lot of times it's difficult to track down what you know why is this person not able to access this thing they should, or why is this thing not being implemented in the way that they think they need it, or whatever it is. With SD access, the SD address is no longer you know part of the segmentation of this. Segmentation is done through the binary code of one bit, and it's having that that device or user be assigned to a group within that binary code, and that is what becomes the the base of policy for what group they're in, what access does that group or user have within that binary code, and then once again, as that device is picked up and moved, the identity of the machine can be played, and we want to keep that policy consistent with what we're doing. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into that in terms of what this kind of digital divide is. You know, read logic is just a rust test architecture with bin classes and SD address. So again, we use ARIF as our policy engine for this solution that we wanted to get that group assigned to each other. And that was a configuration for this, although it can be instantiated within an ARIF device, it also can be instantiated within bin classes. So we still have these potentially security kind of Looking at the drawing here, we've got an employee that's plugged in in VLAN B. So you'll see as she comes onto the network, um, authenticate or read profile to determine what the device is. There is a policy that's defined within ARIF that's been pushed over to the network. And you'll see a access file or there's a device that's been extended to be non compliant. And that non compliance could be um, that the device is not on proper network or being provided with access to that device or that there's a co-host of different things that can't be on the device that's being pushed over to the network. But they all have a, a policy defined within the matrices of the bin classes and SD address. Once a device connects, that policy then for the device is for that device group is pushed out to the bus to the enforcement stands in the network. So in this case, it's the one that has the security kind of built firewall via the device is potentially moved around the network, here we have the employee and this non-compliant device moved to a different part of the network, that policy is kind of maintained. So it's they in the same machine, that policy is now maintained in terms of the policy for that machine being on that network. You also have the potential that, you know, that non-compliant device, it may need to re access to a resource that become compliant by using some of the uh, updates and the ARIF. So you want to be get really track where the link is, but there's no reason why you should be able to communicate with devices on that local network. So using that group policy, the Lantern talked about, we're able to block that communication even on the local network. Um, so to kind of recap what's going on here, there's a, a level of classification that happens through the profiling, through the authentication, and that can be done statically or dynamically um, in good faith. And, and that determines the group. So once you have the group, then there's a scalable group test or an SGT that gets applied to that group. Um, the policies for that group are pushed out to the enforcement point, and then that policy gets applied to every packet that that device sends. So once that um, packet reaches the policy enforcement point, it's scalable to that group that can then control what happens to that group. It can be, yeah. Early 2.1x was born in order to, again, assign the user to the group, or again, it can be done via device. So 
Lord is so sovereign. And we've got five helmets. Some kind of web authentication. So there's multiple different ways that we can determine which group or device is actually placing it. And then once it's placed in that group, that will that will determine what the actual intent is of that group. Okay. Um, okay. Um, almost done here. This. Um, so when you have this level of automation um, happening, when you're pushing out uh, configuration automatically, or you're having the network actually do lots of things that's going on in the network, uh, a critical component of that is going to be visibility. You need to understand, okay, is the policy that I've got on this working or not? Is is the traffic getting to where I need it to? Are there other issues happening in the network? So uh, an important part of this is the network data capture. And that is the analytics engine that we're going to be talking about that really collects all of the parameters in the network and uh, determines, provides visibility into what's happening. So there's various points of parameters that bring up the AAA record, NNN, C, CC, syslog, netflow, all the traditional vectors of parameters that you're used to, um, but they're being aggregated there with policies or analytics that are being done on those, uh, those data points from human to human learning, and also from the fact that uh, different parts of the network are all reporting this information and it's a crowdsourcing component to the analytics that it allows us to really kind of do some predictions about uh, areas of the network that might be problem potential points that could lead to problems later and ultimately give you the option of fixing those problems before they occur or depending on what that might be but picking something up and and allowing that to be solved for you. So we talked a little bit about this, you know, why SPF or why SPF or why SPF, but um, the you know this is really one of the industry's first policy-based automation um, solutions to drive from edge to cloud. Wherever the device attaches or however it moves in the network and says, exit the fabric, um, we've got this address. The ability to control what happens and to provide automation to that. It's a foundation for the Cisco digital network architecture. Um, so the digital network architecture is kind of our broader SDN vision. Um, it includes software-defined access, but it also includes our IWAN, which is our uh, SD-WAN solution. And we also have enterprise virtualization and then the last step here is our SPF it's about providing uh, a single fabric for delivering network services for wired or wireless and then ultimately it's about providing simplified processing so simplifying how you apply these complex capabilities to the network and uh, ultimately saving you money